Before I knew a lot about springs, my only idea of them was that thing in a cookie pen that allows it to work. However, as I will know later, springs are much more complex than just that. Properties like the mass, the spring constant, the gravity, and the damping of a spring all determine exactly how the spring will evolve. You can use the equilibrium point, the natural length, the displacement, and all the factors that I talked about earlier to figure out the amplitude and the period of the spring, which is important. You can use their unique energy dynamics to figure out how much energy the system has, from kinetic energy to potential energy, to thermal energy, which is from damping, to the total energy in the system. And there is a lot more to springs than just this. All of this contributes to what I would consider the beauty of springs. Part one. Spring basics. So, what is a spring? A spring is a mechanical device that stores potential energy. So, I have a spring with a mass on the end. I will compress the, the spring like this. Now, I will release the spring. You can see that it naturally goes into a sine wave pattern. You might think that the sine wave is nothing special, but it is these sine waves that will lead us to our journey through springs. Let me graph where the ball is at each moment after I release the spring. It looks like a cosine wave. Also. When I put the ball at a special location, and then release the spring, the spring will not move; it stays put. This special location is marked in this black dashed line. There are three important points in the system. The first two are the two turning points. One of them represents the point in which the spring is stretched all the way. And the other represents when the spring is contracted all the way. The third important point is the equilibrium point. It represents the point in which, when you place the ball there, the spring would not move. When I release a spring, it naturally goes into sinusoidal motion like this, but it also goes into a wave between. Kinetic and potential energy. Let me explain. When I release the spring, there are three major points in the system: two turning points and one equilibrium point. Now I have stopped the animation at one turning point. Here, the velocity of this spring is zero, so its kinetic energy will still be zero. However, this spring still has potential energy that it can use to pull the spring back. So, at this turning point, the kinetic energy of the spring is zero, while the potential energy of the spring is at its maximum. The same is true for the other turning point. Now. Let me look at the equilibrium point somewhere in between. Now the velocity of the spring is at its maximum, so it has maximum kinetic energy. But right now, when I put the ball there, it will just not move. All its movement comes from its kinetic energy. So this spring at its equilibrium point. Will have zero potential energy, and if I continue this sinusoidal motion, there is a continuous trade-off between potential energy and kinetic energy. Part two.
Hooke's Law. We have already learned that when you release a spring, it goes into sinusoidal motion. But there are many factors that will influence the amplitude of the cosine wave made by the spring. One of this is the spring constant. The spring constant depends on the material that the spring is made of, and how stiff. The spring is basically it is just a property of the spring. Now, look what happens when I vary around the spring constant. It goes into a different wave. Here I have two springs. They are labeled one and two, and they have the spring con the same spring constant with one hundred. Gram masses on both of them. Now I'm going to pull spring one farther than I pull spring two. Now when I release the springs, spring one pulls back with a much greater force than spring two. That is because I stretched it farther than spring two. Now let's do another experiment, where the spring constant of spring one is much smaller than that of spring two. This time, I'm going to pull each spring the exact same amount. As you can see, spring two pulls back much harder than spring one. This is because the spring constant of Spring two is much greater than spring one, so it pulls with a much greater force. In fact, scientists have been able to describe this relationship. This is called Hooke's law. Mathematically, Hooke's law can be written like this. Here. F is equal to the force applied by the spring after you release it. K is the spring constant, and X is the distance that you pull or push the spring. Now, technically, both the F and the X are vectors, so the equation should look more like this. The negative sign indicates that the force vector is opposite that of the vector in which you push or pull the spring. Part three: simple harmonic motion. We all know the equation F equals m a. That is Newton's second law. Here, f is equal to negative kx, and a is equal to the second derivative of position x. So we can substitute in like this. Here, I will denote the second derivative as x under two dots. Now, this is a second-order differential equation. Which can be rewritten like this. Then the solution to the differential equation will look like this. Here, a and b are constants depending on the initial conditions. So I have found this function here, but how do I determine the amplitude? And the period of this spring. Well, for the amplitude, that is incredibly easy. It is just by how much I stretch this spring. Suppose I stretch the spring to this level, and then I release the spring. Assuming no friction, then the amplitude of this spring will be how much I stretch it. But what about the period? What does the period of the spring depend on? You might think 
Well, it depends on amplitude, right? Well, let us do an experiment. Here I have a spring, and on the left is a timer. Now I will stretch the spring, and then release it. And then I will record the period. Around zero point eight three seconds. Now I will reset it, and stretch it to a. Farther length. And it is still zero point eight three seconds. This means that no matter how you stretch or compress the spring, it will have the exact same period. It turns out that the period t is equal to two pi times the square root of m divided by k. But why? Well, if we measure a spring, we will get a equals negative omega squared times x. A is the acceleration, and omega refers to the angular momentum of the mass on the spring. You may consider that. The mass on the spring has nothing to do with angular momentum, but the two ideas are analogous. It turns out that you can represent a mass on a spring by a point on a unit circle. The omega term simply refers to the angular momentum of the point on that imaginary unit circle. Now the restoring force will be equal to this. Here we can determine omega to be equal to the square root of k divided by m, but it is also equal to two pi divided by the period t. Now combining both equations, we get our equality. Part four: springs and optics. Say that. You shine a laser beam from air to water. As it passes into the water, it bends. This is a process called refraction. When a light ray enters the water, it changes direction so that the angle of incidence is greater than the angle of refraction. The two angles are related to each other by Snell's law. Snell's law states. That the sine of theta divided by the velocity of light in a medium is the same for all media, where theta is the angle that the light makes with the line perpendicular to the interface between the two media. But why is this true? Well, something called Fermat's principle tell us that light always travel in the path of least time. You might think that the straight line path between point A and point B would be the fastest, but this is not true. Because point A is in the air and point B is in the water, and light is slower in the water than in air, this means that you want to minimize the time that you spend in the water. So you might shift the path of the light from the straight line to a line that looks like this, where it is shifted all the way to the right. But this is not the best solution either, because the distance from point A. To the water-air interface is now longer. This means that light has to travel for a longer time. So you want to find a balance between a short path and minimizing the time you take in the water. You may try out this problem with geometry, like this. If this is a calculus lesson, then we can simply graph 
a function of x and then find the place where its derivative will be 0 around here. But we have something better than calculus. Optics is not the only place where nature finds a minimum. Nature also finds a minimum in energy. Consider placing a rod on the interface between air and water, like this. Then place a ring on the rod that is free to slide around. Place a spring from point A to the ring and another spring from the ring to point B. Now we have to make sure that each spring has a constant tension equal to one divided by the velocity of light in its medium. Now, constant tension springs don't really exist in real life, but it helps us solve our problem in a really neat way. By just balancing forces. When I release the spring, it naturally finds its equilibrium state, shown right here. We can deduce that the left force component exerted by the top spring is equal to the rightwards component exerted by the bottom spring. Otherwise, the spring would move. It turns out that these leftward and rightward forces are equal to the tension forces multiplied by the sine of theta. Now, because we already know what those tension forces are, we can substitute in, like this. Then, by rearranging this equation, we can get this. That is Snell's Law. Part 5. The Damping But I said earlier that springs naturally go into sinusoidal motion, right? So a spring cannot possibly find its equilibrium position like this, right? Here is the thing. There will always be some sort of friction in the system slowing the spring down. In my previous animations, the friction, or damping as it is so called, is set to zero. But when I add in the damping, it quickly stops. Now, depending on the amount of damping in a system, the spring system will exhibit different behaviors. The damping ratio, represented by the Greek letter zeta, is a dimensionless quantity that quantifies the amount of damping in the spring system. This damping ratio is defined by the damping coefficient, which we will get into later. Now, when zeta equals zero, it is considered to be undamped. This is when there's no damping. In this case, the spring will just continue on forever. This case is impossible in real life because there's always some sort of friction in the system. Now, this is what a graph of this condition will look like. It looks just like a sinusoidal wave that we talked about earlier. Now, when zeta is between zero and one, it is considered to be undamped. In this case, the spring will overshoot its equilibrium state before dissipating some of its energy and returning to the equilibrium state where it will overshoot again and again. This is the most common case in real life. Now, here is what its graph will look like. It will look like a decaying sinusoidal wave. Now, when zeta is greater than or equal to 1, it is either considered to be critically damped or overdamped. Now, when zeta equals 1, it is considered to be critically damped, and it is the smallest value of zeta such that the spring will not overshoot. If zeta is greater than 1, this means that it will come back to the equilibrium state faster than when zeta is equal to 1. And, like when zeta is equal to 1, it will not overshoot. This is what the graph of zeta equals 1 will look like. Now, say that a spring mass damper system has 
a mass m, a spring constant k, and a damping coefficient c. The damping coefficient can be written in terms of kilograms over seconds, but we will not get to y here. Now, zeta, the damping ratio, is equal to c divided by c subscript c, where the c subscript c term refers to the critical damping in that system. Now, the system's equation of motion will look like this. Then, c subscript c will be equal to 2 times the square root of k times m. It can be rewritten like this. Here, omega subscript n is equal to the square root of k divided by m and is the natural frequency of this oscillator. But why? When we consider the definition of the damping ratio and the natural frequency, we will get this second order differential equation. Now the solution to this differential equation will look like this, where x of t equals c times e to the st. Now c and s are both complex constants, and s is equal to negative omega n, that's a natural frequency, multiplied by the quantity zeta plus or minus i times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Now, I am not going to dive into how complex numbers factor into the mix here. That is a whole different story. I will leave it up to you to ponder how springs could possibly relate to complex numbers. Different values of this solution results in different values for zeta, and thus different ways in how the spring system behaves. I would also let you ponder about that. Part 6. Energy Dynamics Here I have a 100 gram mass attached to a spring. When I release the spring, it naturally goes into a decaying sinusoidal wave, as we will expect. However, this is not the complete story, because on the left, you can see energy. There are five kinds of energy represented in here. The kinetic energy, the gravitational potential energy, the elastical potential energy, the thermal energy, and the total energy. You might think that this is not a big deal, but understanding the energy in the system is actually a pretty great deal. Let me explain. To begin, let's first ignore the gravitational potential energy and the thermal energy, and just consider the rest. Now, when I release the spring, it naturally goes into a sinusoidal wave, and it also goes into a wave between the kinetic energy and the elastical potential energy. Now, when I slow it down, you can see that at the two turning points, the kinetic energy is zero, and the elastical potential energy is equal to the total energy in the system. Right in between the two turning points is the equilibrium point. This is when the spring has all of its energy in as kinetic energy, and the elastical potential energy is zero. The equilibrium point is right in between the two turning points. A very important thing to note here is that the total energy in the system always stays the same. This is because of the conservation of energy. Energy always have to go somewhere but it can be transformed into other forms of energy.
even if I add in damping, energy would still be conserved, like this. The kinetic energy of the system K can be written as 1 half mv squared, and the elastic potential energy of the system U can be written as U equals 1 half kx squared. These are just common equations for kinetic energy and elastic potential energy. Now the total energy in the system is just the sum of the two. This can also be written as E equals one half K times A squared, where A is the amplitude. But there are two more types of energy that we haven't considered, the gravitational potential energy and the thermal energy. How can we calculate the energy in each? Well, for the gravitational potential energy, that is fairly easy. We can use the equation for gravitational potential energy, mgh, to derive a fairly simple equation for the gravitational potential energy. But the thermal energy, which is the energy dissipated by the damping in the spring mass damper system, is more difficult. Unfortunately, this is where the equations get less beautiful. Because, as far as I know of, there is no function that will take in a bunch of parameters and then spit out how much energy is lost due to damping. However, we can still model how much energy is lost in a specific time frame. Say that we want to model how much energy the spring loses during one cycle. The equations are not easy, so I will just leave the equations on the screen for the curious of you. Now this negative c x squared omega pi term is the energy lost, or more specifically the energy added by the damper during one cycle. Now the negative sign indicates that the energy is lost, meaning that the damper actually removes energy, which makes sense. Part 6. Other Springs So far, we've only talked about compression springs, that is, springs that behave like this. However, there is much more to springs than just compression springs. Let me explain. This is a torsion spring. When I push on the ends, it wants to pull out. These kinds of springs are commonly found in clamps. When I push on the ends of a clamp, it wants to push back, like this. This is a leaf spring. They are usually made out of metal and can be found on automobiles. They serve a very important job. Let's say that this model of a car's wheels comes across a bump. Here, I will represent this bump as a red rectangle underneath the wheels. Now, this bump may cause shock in some of the other parts of the car, which may damage some pieces. The leaf springs are here to cushion the shock. This thing right here is called a volute spring, also called a conical spring. Volute springs have this advantage over regular compression springs. Compression springs face a limit when the coils touch each other like this. 
However, in volute springs, the coils can slide past each other, making it more flexible than regular compression springs. This kind of spring is used in the M4 Sherman, a tank used by the Allies during World War II, and also in the buffer assemblies of railway cars. One thing that I haven't talked about yet is the Q factor. Q is equal to 1 divided by 2 times zeta, where Q is the Q factor and zeta is the damping ratio. Q is also related to the exponential decay rate. This equation is also equal to alpha divided by omega n, where alpha is the exponential decay rate and omega n is the natural frequency of this system. Oh, and also, omega can be divided into omega n and omega d, which stands for natural frequency and damped frequency, respectively. But these two classifications are too far in the weeds for us to examine. Also, there are more kinds of damping other than the damping we have talked about in this video, such as logarithmic decrement and percentage overshoot. But these kinds of dampings are quite rare. Oh, and let's not even get started on electrical damping in electrical systems. You might see Huxley's Law presented in a different way. Here, I have three identical spring mass systems, except that the mass tied to each spring is different. Take a good look at the first image. In the first image, a one kilogram mass is tied to the spring, stretching it by one centimeter. In the second image, a 2 kilogram mass is tied to the spring, stretching it by 2 centimeters. And in the last photo, a 3 kilogram mass is tied to the spring, stretching it by 3 centimeters. This means that for any unit of mass added to a spring, the spring will be stretched by one additional unit of length. Now, in this case, it is one kilogram for every one centimeter stretched. However, for different springs, this may be different. For example, some springs might take five kilograms to stretch it by one centimeter. However, this only applies when the spring is not stretched beyond its elastic limit. Otherwise, the spring will not work. And this rule that we talked about, and the Hooke's Law that I mentioned at the beginning, will not apply. It absolutely astonishes me that this thing right here can have so much usage in the real world. I mean, it is literally found in everything, from TV remote controllers to electric motors. You know, before I made this video, I thought that springs are always just so simple, yet I now understand that they are much more complex than what meets the eye. So dig deeper on everything simple. You may find a hidden revelation that is there to begin with, but you hadn't discovered yet, waiting for you to be discovered.